Hello, welcome to Morning Mana, April the 20th, 2021. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can continue our study today of your word. We're grateful for all that you've shown us in the past, and we look forward with great anticipation to that which you have for us today. We ask that you would give us the strength that is necessary, so that as we absorb your truth, it will be reflected in our character. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we will continue to take a look at this book, Bible Readings for the Home Circle, and we're going to be taking a look at page 83. The subject is faith. Faith. Now, as I said before, today is the 20th of April, and we've had an opportunity to go back and study quite a number of things that are basic to our understanding of truth. And I thought that it would be important for us to go forward and continue to expand our understanding and to place it in God's words, not just so that we would know it philosophically, but that it would be backed up by the Word of God. As I said before, the book that we're looking at today is Bible Readings for the Home Circle. And we are looking at the subject, faith. Faith. First question. What is faith declared to be? Hebrews 11 and verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that's a really powerful statement. Notice it describes faith as being substance. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Desire of Ages, page 126 in paragraph 1 says, Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. Faith was have led our first parents to trust the love of God and to obey his commands. Presumption led them to transgress his law, to believe that his great love would save them from the consequences of their sin. It is not faith that claims the favor of heaven without complying with the conditions on which mercy is to be granted. Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises and provisions of the scriptures. Now that is an incredibly important quote. Desire of Ages, page 126 in paragraph 1. So in other words, faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Notice the connection between faith and obedience. Presumption, however, also claims the promises but uses them, as Satan did, to excuse transgression. In other words, you're not stopping your sinning. You're just being presumptuous and saying that God is going to forgive you anyway. All right. Next question. How necessary is faith? Verse 6 of Hebrews 11 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice the word diligently there. That's Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Also, um, in the book Evangelism, page 287 and paragraph 2, it says this, The convicted sinner has something to do besides repent. He must act his part in order to be accepted by God. He must believe that God accepts his repentance according to his promise. And the next paragraph says, The work of grace upon the heart is not an instantaneous work. It is affected by continuous, daily watching and believing the promises of God. The repentant, believing one, who cherishes faith and earnestly desires the renewing grace of Christ, God will not turn away empty. He will give him grace and ministering angels will aid him 
as he preserves in his efforts to advance. All right, so now notice it's very important that you've got to understand this. And, and the whole concept of ne the necessity of faith is diligently seeking God, diligently seeking to bring our lives in harmony with God's will. Next question. Is mere assent to divine truth sufficient? In other words, is, is just agreeing that truth is truth, is that sufficient? James chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? In other words, you can believe in one God, but if you are not demonstrating that belief in your attitude and in the things that you do and the decisions that you make, then that is not following Christ. Signs of the Times, May the 19th, 1819, paragraph 10 says, From the pulpits of the day the words are uttered, Believe, only believe, have faith in Christ. You have nothing to do with the old law, only trust in Christ. How different is this from the words of the Apostle, who declares that faith without works is dead. He says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And of course, that's Signs of the Times, May the 19th, 1890, paragraph 10. Next question. What is required besides a belief in the existence of God? One of the texts we looked at already, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Child Guidance, page 69 in paragraph 3 says, Let there be a deep and thorough repentance before God. Commence the year by earnest seeking God for grace, for spiritual discernment to discover the defects in the work of the past. And My Life Today, page 58 in paragraph 3 says, Let there be a work of reformation and repentance. Let all seek for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as with the disciples after the ascension of Christ. It may require several days of earnest seeking God and putting away of sin. Now that is very serious counsel. It might not happen immediately, but we must be consistent and diligent in our seeking him. Next question. From whom does faith come? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. So Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says that faith is a gift of God. Review in Herald, December the 24th, 1908, and paragraph 5 says, Faith that enables us to receive God's gifts is itself a gift, of which some measure is imparted to every human being. It grows as it is exercised in appropriating the word of God. In order to strengthen faith, we must often bring it in contact with the word. So in other words, you cannot really have a strengthening faith if you are not studying the Word of God as you go forward day by day. And paragraph 2 of that same review in Herald, December the 24th, 1908 says, The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. The simple faith that takes God at his word should be encouraged. God's people must have that faith which will lay hold of divine power. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
Those who believe that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven their sins should not, through temptation, fail to press on to fight the good fight of faith. Their faith should grow stronger until their Christian life, as well as their words, shall declare, The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And of course, that's Review and Herald, December the 24th, 1908, paragraph 2. Next question. Why was Christ raised from the dead? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21 says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. So, why was he raised? Listen to what Desire of Ages, page 787 in paragraph 2 says. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with him above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And of course, Review and Herald, February the 10th, 1891, and paragraph 5 says, We are not saved as a sect. No denominational name has any virtue to bring us into favor with God. We are saved individually as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We may have our names recorded on the books of the most spiritual of the churches, and yet we may not belong to Christ, and our names may not be written on the Lamb's book of life. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If we could reach heaven through our own merits and efforts, then Christ need not have come to the world to endure suffering, reproach, and shame, to be subjected to humiliation, mockery, insult, and death. He made an infinite sacrifice because it was the only way whereby man could be saved. Those who believe in Christ will reveal it in their life and character. By beholding Christ, they will be changed into his image, and Christ will be a represented person to the world by his followers. Next question. What is the source of our faith? Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we also have compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> Acts of the Apostles, page 312 in paragraph 1, says envy, malice, evil thinking, evil speaking, covetousness. These are weights that the Christian must lay aside if he would run, uns run successfully the race for immortality. Every habit or practice that leads into sin and brings dishonor upon Christ must be put away, whatever the sacrifice. The blessing of heaven cannot attend any man in violating the eternal principles of right. One sin cherished is sufficient to work degradation of character and to mislead others. Manuscript 20 and verse, uh, Manuscript 20 written in 1905 says, We are to be sincere, earnest Christians, doing faithfully the duties placed in our hands and looking ever to Jesus, the author and finisher 
of our faith. Our reward is not dependent upon our seeming success, but upon the spirit in which our work is done. What a powerful counsel they're found. Next question. What is the basis of faith? Romans 10 and verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Christ Object Lessons, page 100 in paragraph 2 says, The truths of the word of God meet man's great practical necessity, the conversion of the soul through faith. These grand principles are not to be thought too pure and holy to be brought into the daily life. There are truths which reach to heaven and come past eternity, yet their vital influence is to be woven into human experience. They are to permeate all the great things and all the little things of life. Receive into the heart the leaven of truth will regulate the desires, purify the thoughts, and sweeten the dispositions. It quickens the faculties of the mind and energies of the soul. It enlarges the capacity for feeling, for loving. So in other words, now, the basis of our faith expands our personalities and brings our characters into line with the character of Christ. Next question. What relation does faith bear to knowledge? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which were seen were not made of things which do appear. What a clear and powerful description. Notice what Evangelism, page 593 in paragraph 1 says, along the same vein. I have been warned that henceforth, we shall have a constant contest. Science, so-called, and religion will be placed in opposition to each other because finite men do not comprehend the power and greatness of God. These words of holy writ were presented to me. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. This will surely be seen among the people of God and there will be those who who are unable to perceive the most wonderful and important truths for this time, truths which are essential for their own safety and salvation, while matters that are in comparison as the merest atoms, matters in which there is scarcely a grain of truth, are dwelt upon and are magnified by the power of Satan, so that they appear of utmost importance. While the Word of God is even wiser and greater than all this. Evangelism, page 593, and paragraph 2 continues. It says, The moral sight of these men is diseased. They do not feel their need of the heavenly anointing that they may discern spiritual things. They think themselves too wise to err. Men who have not a daily experience in the things of God will not move wisely in dealing with sacred responsibilities. They will mistake light for error. A spacious error they will pronounce light. Mistaking phantoms for reality and realities for phantoms. Calling a world an atom and an atom a world. They will fall into deceptions and delusions that Satan has prepared as concealed nets to entangle the feet of those who think they can walk in their human wisdom without the special grace of Christ. Jesus wants man to see not men as trees walking, but all things clearly. There is only one remedy for the sinful soul, and unless it is received, men will accept one delusion after another until their senses are perverted. So now notice she's talking here about the fact that we accept science, so-called, which is flawed in so many areas, rather than the Word of God. Next question. By what principle is genuine faith actuated? Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. In Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, 
nor uncons- uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So in other words, it's not the circumcision that does it, but it is the faith in God that we demonstrate in our daily lives each and every day. Today we have had an opportunity to take a look at the Word of God and the power that it shows in everything that we do. Lake Union Herald, November the 17th, 1909, and paragraph 10 says, Sincere faith in Christ is that alone which can secure for us an entrance into the city of God. Notice that sentence again. Sincere faith in Christ is that alone which can secure for us an eternal entrance into the city of God. Faith in Christ expressed in the life and character revealed in love for God and for our brethren makes the human agent a power in the world and in the church. I am made sad to see that many have not this faith and love, for these are the signs of our Christianity, the witness that we are the children of God, True faith in Christ will recover the backslider from the entanglements of the world and engage him from day to day in service that will keep his brethren from backsliding. This is the work that God requires of every soul. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, If you have lost the liberty you once enjoyed in Christ, you may recover yourself from your backslidings. If you will look to Jesus and accept his word in faith, you may present to the world a very different showing from that you have given in the past. In your life and character, you may reveal the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. What a powerful description of faith and its need, its source, and what is needed in our lives. And today God is calling us to have that faith again, allow ourselves to trust in him implicitly, and he will do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessings that you share with us, for the truth that you reveal. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us that which we need most, faith that we might walk according to your will in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been Morning Manor, April the 20th, 2021.